Hello and welcome to the Moving Past You radio show. I'm your host Juanita Gaynor and I definitely want to welcome you to this evening's show. I want to say happy September to everyone. Um, this year is flying by so quickly and I'm actually excited for September because this month we are doing a series called Character Under Construction. That's right. And tonight's topic is starts with controlling our thoughts. But before we go ahead and get deep into what that's going to be, we're definitely going to just open up in prayer. Um, Lord, we long to break free from the negative thinking and embrace peace and joy and optimism. We invite you to begin transforming our thought patterns and help us to recognize and to reject and to replace the thoughts that are not pleasing to you. Strengthen us, guide us so that we can search only you. In your son's precious and holy name, amen. And so... With everything that has been going on in the world, in everything, I thought this was just an appropriate um, series to embark upon because not only is it for just everyone, it's something that I'm going through as well. It's like a renewal process. And in a day and age where character and integrity seem to be, you know, at an all-time low or it's under attack mightily by the enemy. We are going to discuss some ways uh, this entire month to build only, you know, not only to build it, but to protect it. You know, so tonight's scriptures are coming from two base scriptures. The first one is Philippians 4 and 8. And we're going to discuss the New Living Translation version of that. And it reads as such. And now... Dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And our second foundational scripture comes from Romans, the 12th chapter, the first and the second verse. And we're going to take that from the King James Version. And it reads as such. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is good and acceptable and perfect will of God. See, character is a big thing. So when we think about character, we you have to ask yourself, you know, where do I go to develop character in my life? You know, especially in this world that is, you know, obsessed with our outward appearance. We need to remember that God is in the process of developing character in our lives and he wants us to be a part of that process. You know, when we choose to renew our minds, it will result in transformed lives. See, character is a more important than personal achievement or fulfillment. Character is the, you know... It's something more than just any of those other things. And that is why this series is so important. You know, the the Bible is not silent when it comes to our minds and our thinking. And I'm going to give you a few scripture references to just show you where God really talks about our mind. So we have 2 Timothy the first chapter in the seventh verse, and it speaks of a sound mind. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. When the Bible speaks about our minds, they talk about he talks it talks about a renewed mind. Again, Romans twelve two and be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And when we read back to the Bible, it talks about a biblical mind. And that is in um, the book of Psalms 1, 
um, verse 2 and it says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And finally, when we talk about the Bible and when it speaks where our mind should be, it talks about a Christ-like mind. And again, that is in Philippians 2 and 5. And it says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. See, the pathway to controlling our thoughts begins with the understanding of our relationship to Christ. See, when we were saved, a change took place. We were raised up with Christ and we now have a new position in him. And God desires that we also have a new way of thinking and responding to situations and people and places. You know, of course, our past experiences can and feelings can produce inaccurate thoughts about ourselves. For example, you know, we could think we're ugly. When in reality, we're beautiful. I mean, shoot, when I was younger, I thought I was ugly as well. And a lot of people was like, oh, no, you're so pretty. But I didn't see that. So therefore, that was my thought process. And a lot of people don't know that I probably thought that. Like, for a long time, I didn't like what I saw. What, when I looked in a mirror, I wasn't pleased with that. I wasn't welcome into that. I didn't like what I, you know, was seeing. So therefore, it is very, you know, possible that we have that thought process in our head, even though other people are telling us that we're beautiful and or you have a beautiful spirit and things like that. So it's our mind is it plays tricks on us. It can be deceitful. You know, although these faulty perceptions not not may these perceptions start very early in life you know is around people and places is who we grow up with is the neighborhood kids it's the you know the church mothers and the people in the church it's so many people that help form your perceptions at a young age but see god wants to give us a new way of thinking which is based on reality and so when we think about that, you know, of course, there's challenges sometimes to controlling our thoughts. You know, salvation changes our lives and eternal destiny, but it doesn't instantly alter how we think. Again, people, so many people believe that once you become saved, once you, you know, decide to give your life to Christ, it's supposed to be instant and everything is supposed to just work out all right. And that is the furthest from the, you know, furthest from the truth. You know, we have to stop treating God like he is some magic genie that we just rub on this little face and that whatever who our heart and our want and our desire is, that it just instantly comes up. That is not how it works. We, we have to go through a process. So... You know, when we decide to give our life to Christ, our struggle begins because we are still in the old way of thinking. We have to be taught to think in the new way. And the reason why there's challenges when we give our life to Christ is our environment is still the same. In fact, sometimes our situations can get worse when we're called to be righteous um, and to be a child of God, especially when we're in an ungodly environment, you know. So to accomplish this, we have to learn how to think right. We have to understand the scripture. We have to build up a relationship with Christ and begin to put the whole armor on so that, therefore, we can actually go to battle with the enemy. And not saying combat and things like that, but... We go to battle because we, we know the word. We, we go to battle. We use the word as our weapon. We don't try to outwit him, outsmart him, out-argue with him, out-talk him. Like if Jesus used his father's word and he was deity, he was God in the flesh and he used his father's word, what are we to think that we should use something different? Why do we feel that we know better than God? 
why do we feel that we, even though God did it one way, we should have this undying audacity to do it another way? Wrong answer. Also, when we become believers, Satan blinds the minds of unbelievers. See, the gospel is veiled to those who are perishing because their minds are blinded by the God, by Satan. And see, what he does is when you become a believer, when you've decided that, you know what, that veil is no longer there and you've taken it off. What he does is that the people around you who have not chosen to be a believer they don't understand. They, you know, to them, you've changed. You become new. You become something new. And you have become something new, not the way they're saying it. And see, also, as another challenge we have, is Satan is out there deceiving us. See, what he uses as a battlefield is our mind. And see, his goal is to lead us from our devotion to Christ. He brings up old hurts, old memories, mistreatments that would happen back in the day. You know, he'll have us dwell on them and the experience, the suffering all over again. And see, the only way to really protect ourselves from his deception is to fill our minds with God's word. And also, willful disobedience results in a retrobate mind. Like, if we think about sin and deliberately give ourselves over, we can suffer the consequences for a very long time. Even if we later forsake our sin and return to God, the memories may haunt us until we allow Jesus to deliver us from them. And see, this is what I, I tell a lot of, you know, my students, just because God is grateful and graceful and he gives us grace and mercy each and every day that can run out you can't keep doing what you were doing how you was doing it when you was doing it with whom you was doing it and he's going to continue to forgive you there's going to come a point where you will experience his wrath so you need to not play like that when you make a mistake repent truly repent and then no longer do it. I am so grateful that we have the Holy Spirit to help us think right. You know, we never have to be defeated by our old ways because God gave us his spirit to empower us to think differently. God helps us remember scripture and replaces old recurrent thoughts with his truth. You know, that was the one blessing, you know, because think about it. Jesus was down here on earth. He walked the earth. He understood. And I have a feeling, and this is just my interpretation. You know, he had a great conversation with his father and was like, they're going to need help. They're not going to be able to do this on their own. If we leave them to their own devices again, we're we going to we're going to go through this again. So we need to send something that can help them and guide them, you know, and be our overarching eyes so that we can get to the ultimate goal that we have. And so that is the benefit of the Holy Spirit. It, it's something to help guide us to a proper thinking, you know. So we have to also think about, when we think about our mind, there's so many things that are embraced in our thoughts. There's so many things that make up our thoughts. Um, we can think about, you know, unseen thoughts produce visual consequences. You know, although no one knows our thoughts or sees our thoughts. See, they're eventually revealed in our faces, in our actions, and ultimately in our destinies. Now, that is so true because most people, I tell people, I, there's no point for me to ever lie to you about something because I may say it, but my face is going to give away how I truly feel 100% of the time. So therefore, there's just no no 
possibility, no chance, no way for, to, to ask me the question. Don't even ask me a lie. Like if you ask me a question and I disagree, I'm just going to be honest about it. And I've gotten a lot of pushback from people and they're like, well, why don't you just, why do you have to be so abrupt or why do you have to just be honest? Can't you just fudge it a little bit? No, because you're going to see it in my face that I'm, you know, I may be saying, oh, that's cute, but my face is looking at you like that is so ugly, you know? So what is the point of making, you know, whatever? So anything that we're thinking, how we're thinking about somebody, how we feel about somebody, it's going to show up in our faces. It's going to show up in our actions. And because of that, if we don't correct that, it's going to show up in how we appear, you know, See, we sow a thought and reap an action. We sow an action, we reap a habit. We sow a habit, we reap a character. We sow a crap character, we reap destiny. You know, when a thought comes into our minds, we have so many options. We have several options regarding what you can do with it. You can accept the thought and express it in some manner. You can wrestle with it for a while. You can deny it. Or you can control it. And I know some people, I know I asked this question of a group of students and everyone, everyone chose either one or two to either accept the thought and express it in some manner or to wrestle with it for a while. And I say that is the wrong answer. You want to learn how to control it. Because accepting something could mean, you know, you walking out of your destiny. Wrestling with something can mean that you are preoccupied and you miss what you're supposed to see. See, the power of our thoughts, you know, is where many of the strongholds begin. See, the enemy loves to put thoughts and craziness into our minds. You know, those thoughts that he can put into and plant in our minds, if we meditate on those thoughts, they produce strongholds, which produces the feelings, which lands us into bondage, all because we listen to Satan more than our Heavenly Father. You know, so we're going to talk about a common stronghold, you know, that... In this example that I'm about to say, and it's like, you know, an incorrect perception of who you are in Christ. You know, there are many other strongholds out there, but we're going to focus on this one. And it just can give you just a general idea of how it can, how it can form in your mind and how it works. So basically, you know, two voices are speaking. Satan comes along and be like, Look at what you did five years ago. You know that was bad. You know you're not good. You're a failure. You ain't worth anything. But see, Jesus, through his father's words, tries to tell us that if we turn to him, we'll be forgiven. And that our past is forgotten. As he says in Isaiah 43, 20, 25, it says, I, even I am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for mine own sake and will not remember thy sins. And see, you're faced with a choice. You can either listen to Satan's deceptions and lies that you're a failure. Or you can listen to God's word that tells us. That our past has been forgiven and washed away. And we are a new creature in Christ. See, whichever voice you listen to, it will crowd the other one out. So, you know, at this, you know, think about it as in the terms of animals. Like, if you have two dogs who fight all the time, and you can only afford to feed one of them, how do you know which one will win? The one who's going to win is going to be the one you feed. And it's the same is true in the spiritual realm. The more you listen to Satan's lies and deceptions, 
the more he builds strongholds in your mind. And the more the strongholds that go up, the harder it is to hear God's voice. Now see, the other side is true as well. The more you feast yourself on the truth of God's word, the more it tears down strongholds and it makes it harder for the enemy's voice to penetrate you. Now see, if you listen to Satan's lies that you're a failure, he's going to continue to feed you that lie. He's going to have fun with it. One thing I've always, I tell everyone, the reason why Satan is good at his job is because he loves it. He loves lies. He loves deception. He loves drama. He loves craziness. He loves anything that is going to attempt to tear down the kingdom. And so he delights in feeding you drama and lies. He delights bringing up past transgressions that God has already forgiven you for. He loves using friends and family to make you feel low and worthless so that you can stop going in the path that God has told you to go into so that he can stop your progress. You know, your feelings are quite often a direct result of our thoughts. If you think you're a failure, you're going to feel like one. But now, if you listen to God, who is speaking truth through his word, see, you're going to tear down those strongholds in your life. See, when you meditate on the truth in God's word, it will become a part of you. And before long, you'll be feeling different. Simply because you are exchanging the lies of Satan for the truth in God's word. See, when you believe that your sins are forgiven and you can allow your conscience to be cleansed um, from the sin and by the blood of Jesus. You know, Hebrews 9.14 says, How much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from the dead works of serving the living God. See, we are to focus on what is true rather than what is not true. I'm going to say that again. We're going to focus, we are to focus on what is true rather than what is not true. See, the word true can stand in opposition to many different words. Sometimes it can be true instead of false, true instead of fickle, true instead of crooked, you know. And see, and just like when when I say crooked, it means so when they say in more so in construction terms, when they say a wall is true, meaning it is straight, it's plumb true instead of phony so which use of true does Paul intend could it be that he means all of them we tend to spend our time thinking about things that are accurate and genuine and reliable and in order to do this we need to do at least three things you know number one we need to become aware of the falsehoods that masquerade as truth you know we have to think consciously we have to learn how to think consciously you know and it can i know it sounds redundant and repetitive but it really isn't see we've been we're being giving ideas and philosophies all the time sometimes we're aware of those things and sometimes we're not Much of what takes place is on a subconscious level. Our brain is hearing them and receiving these messages. And and we're not really aware of it. See, it wasn't long ago that we learned that, you know, many people and maybe still are using subliminal message. You know, in a movie theater, you know, 
they would insert several scattered frames into a movie that might show a bucket of, a bucket of popcorn, an icy glass of soda, and some candy. And you wouldn't be able to see these frames because they would go by so quickly. But your brain would see it. And immediately you want some popcorn. It's a subtle form of mind control. And, you know, that is how, you know, they do work in advertisement. You think about it. If you've ever been and watched a, t- a television show and they, you know, had, you know, what they call ad placement and you see a Whopper and then about five minutes later you want a Whopper. Or, you know, you want some wings. <laughs> That's what it does. You know. Um, and even though in a lot of places it's illegal to do that. Because, you know, they call it marketing tricks and things like that. It, it doesn't change the subconscious. It doesn't change us from receiving, you know, it. Because our subconscious receives more information than we realize. You know, just a few examples of that. Have you ever awakened to say you set your alarm um to what are the ten o'clock in the morning? Okay, like three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning when you gotta get up. And you instead of just making it a regular one, you make sure it's programmed to the radio. So when you wake up, you woke up to this song, but then Have you found out that you heard yourself humming the song all day long that was playing? You may not have heard the song, but you heard the song. You know, another example is like, have you ever been watching television? And then you find yourself humming the music from the commercial? See, not only are the advertisers trying to persuade us to buy their product, but commercials are also presenting certain values. You know, so that is their way of trying to subtly introduce things. You know, if we watch the movies, the television, the theater, and the, the news There are things often promoting certain values and behaviors that we don't quickly see because we considered entertainment values neutral and it is not. See, we must work to make these messages conscious so that we can interact with them. But how do we do that? You know, you can turn the television and the radio off if it's just serving as background noise because you're hearing more than you realize. You know, ask yourself, why do you think the way you do? If this is just the way you think, then take some time to try to identify why you think that way. Again, a journal is the most awesome and the most amazing thing that you can utilize to do so. You know, also when you hear stuff, Learn to ask, is there more to this story? You know, always try to find out the other side because it gives you, you know, very different slant on the truth. Next, we must be intentional about pursuing the truth. See, Paul tells us to think about the pure, you know, and focus on the right. We don't naturally think godly thoughts. We have to work at it. It, it's some. It's somewhat like programming a computer. I love computer programming, by the way. See, we must put the information into the computer before it's any use to us. And obviously, the place to start when it comes to our minds and our spiritual well-being is God's Word. You know, as we... Think on his word, we are anchoring ourselves to a truth that will not drift and is not subject to the whims of public opinion. See, we need to do more than just simply read the Bible. We must know the Bible. See, we we must meditate on the word and apply the values directly to our lives. You know, so... Make time to read and interact with the word daily. 
memorize verses of the Bible so that you can have them when you need them when so that they can get deep in your heart you know there's tons of memorization aids that you can go to a Christian bookstore trust me memorizing key verses and the verses that you know are near and dear to you is necessary especially when you have to come into battle with the enemy because all you need to do is speak God's word you don't need to do anything else nothing else at all you don't have to compromise you don't have to talk about it you don't have to do anything you just need to speak God's word to make the enemy be still and behave you know discuss your day with God talk to him about the troublesome people and situations in your life seek his perspective and then listen to what he has to say Okay, break. Transparency moment. So there's just certain situations that are going on in life and it aggravates me. I I am a person that takes integrity and character very seriously. And when I see it not being exemplified it 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 bothers me in a way that it can it can make me sick it can make me frustrated it can give me it can trigger my migraines and so i had to get back into the habit of talking to god about my day because i stopped doing it i just was getting up moving about going about my day and not having a conversation with my father about the things that I was being anxious for, the things that concerned me, the things that were giving me problems. So therefore, because I wasn't having that conversation with him and because I wasn't seeking his guidance, I would go in frustrated, come out more frustrated to the point where I am pissed off and it wasn't being productive because I'm the one that's in pain for hours on end because I'm upset and I'm angry about a situation, but I didn't talk to God about how my day should go. So I have been taking conscious efforts to do so, so that he can pour into me and tell me how I need to maneuver, when I need to maneuver, and around whom I need to maneuver you know read books that you know really deep dive and expound a point to God's words you know make it a point to ask yourself what is God's perspective on this situation I can't stress that enough I cannot stress it enough you know we we so many times we walk into situations and we do not, we do not seek God on what we need it to do. We go about doing it the way we want to do it. And then we wonder why our lives get turned upside down. See, we have to be diligent and intentional about pursuing the truth. Diligent and intentional. See, we also, we must tell ourselves the truth. You know, we need to remind ourselves that we are created by God, for God, and we reflect God. But we also need to remember that we are sinners that are saved by His grace. And it's so easy for us to forget this. It's so easy for us to start feeling that God is lucky to have us on his side. And see what happens before long we begin to believe that he exists to serve us. Rather than we exist to honor him. See we have to remind ourselves of our weaknesses. Because we want you know not because we want to beat ourselves up. But because we need to understand our weaknesses. See, when you have a problem, whether it be with drugs or alcohol or gambling or, you know, anger issues, 
we you need they need to remember their problem. They need to remember how weak they are so they'll stay away from anything that might lead them back to their addiction. You know, you and I must constantly remind ourselves that our addiction to sin so that we can combat pride and rebellion in our hearts. See, we yes, we're sinful in our heart. But we are also sinful people who've been saved by grace. See, God cares about us. He loves us and has provided the way for us to be forgiven and transformed. See, he provided Christ. It's death like he provided his only son as payment for our sin and gave us the Holy Spirit to help us in the process of growth. Just think about that overarching gift. He gave us gave us his only begotten son who came down in flesh, dwelt among us, went through the ups and the downs, the highs and the lows, the everyday Things that we go through from birth to adulthood. He saw the trials that we had. He saw the struggles that we had. And so therefore he knew that and also taking on the sin that when he went back up to be with his father that they needed to send the Holy Spirit to help us progress and process and grow. So that we wouldn't get complacent in where we were. Because being complacent is not a place you want to be. You know. Do you know or realize what creates the greatest amount of anxiety in our lives? I know it created an anxiety in minds. If it created and no one else's, it created one in minds, and it was drawn um, coming to a premature conclusion regarding the circumstances of my life. See, we have to stick with what we know, and we have to be careful of how we interpret those things you know that's where it comes to lean not to your own understanding but in all that ways see basically here's a good one it's like suppose a, a, a spouse or family member or child is delayed getting home See, what happens is that our mind begins to play with us and we begin to imagine things. We we imagine they were in an accident or if it's your spouse or, you know, an intimate relationship, you think they're having an affair or the worst case thing is you think they've been abducted. You just begin to just think of crazy things. See, our imagination robs us of peace and anxiety builds up Fast and furious. See, in these times, we must remind ourselves the truth. Our family member is just late. That is the only true fact we have. Of course, we could remind ourselves that this family member is a careful driver, is responsible, and sometimes loses track of time. You know, suppose we've gotten, you know, you've gotten older and you're finding that you can't do something that you used to do. Maybe you can no longer play sports. Maybe you can't drive anymore because your eyesight is bad. Maybe you're having trouble getting around because your body just don't work too well. Now, you know, my knees be acting up, you know, and I realize that there's a difference between, you know, 25 and 45. So, I, I, you just can't, you know, some things, the body, yes, if you keep your body great in shape, yes, you can do it. But, you know, it's something that young people can do a whole lot more. I'm not going to, I know for a fact, you know. So, at this point, you know, when when things happen, when body, you know, we have some ailments, we can tend to tell ourselves that our life is over. Well, I don't tell myself that because I'm just starting. But 
we do tend to tell ourselves, oh, life is over. You know, we can just sit back and relax or it's the end is coming. You know, we can't do anything anymore. And then you start to feel sorry for yourself. And again, at this point, we need to tell ourselves the truth. Yes, we can't do what we used to do. Just because we can't do what we used to do doesn't mean we can't do anything. We just need to find something different to do. That is basically all. See, if we can learn to train ourselves to focus on the truth, we will find that anxiety will be replaced with peace. You know, again, we need to focus on the positive rather than the negative. See, Paul tells us that we should think about things that are noble and lovely and admirable and praiseworthy. Basically, in other words, we should turn away from dwelling on those things which are offensive and negative. You know, even those outside the church understand this. You know, one, if you think about it, one of the most famous, you know, management books right now is called Fish. And there's a small book that tells the secret of the Seattle Fish Company, how he learned to make their business fun, effective, and more profitable. And the first secret of their success is that they understood that they chose the attitude they have toward their work. You know, they wasn't going to moan about their jobs. They wasn't going to complain about how to literally, they literally that got paid. They can simply endure or we can choose to enjoy um, we can choose to make it fun. We can choose to focus on service we can extend or the benefit we can provide. See, if we focus, we can focus on our inability or we can focus on God's great sufficiency. You know, it's our choice and we need to remind ourselves this. The same is true for people. See, we can spotlight their failures or build their victories. We can spotlight their strengths, you know, we can build their strengths or we can spotlight their weaknesses. You know, we choose how we see others. Have you ever stopped to listen to yourself? Don't answer that because sometimes I have. <laughs> and sometimes it's not great. Because if you ever stop to listen to yourself, think about this. How much time did you spend highlighting and talking about the weaknesses of other people rather than talking about their strengths? I know I was guilty of that. Because that could be the one thing that you can talk an hour on the negative, on what they have, what they don't have, things like that. But you don't spend the same amount of time invested into what their strengths are. You know. And the reason why sometimes we do that, not sometimes, a lot of the times that we do that, because talking about someone else's weaknesses makes us feel superior. Makes us feel like we are higher. Makes, makes us feel like we're set apart. You know, how are we better off for ridiculing the weakness or the, the problems or the quirks of someone else? See, we need to celebrate and spotlight people's progress rather than their weakness. And I take this to heart. It was it was an experiment that I had when I was um, doing vacation Bible school. And it was in a neighborhood where the children, of course, you know, they all received school lunch and free lunch and Reading was down, math was down, and just overall probably morale was down. And what I would normally do is, if you know what we do, if there was something going wrong at home or whatever, the kids come in wired for sound. So this particular year, I made it an effort like, okay, we know we're going to have some children that's going to have behavioral issues. I said, but this year... Instead of calling the parents to tell them what they did bad, let's call the parents and tell them what they learned that evening. And 
if the child misbehaves or something goes on, what we do is we correct it and move on. Instead of focusing it and spotlighting what had been done wrong. And then when they do something correct or they learn something new, we spotlight that. We focus on that tremendously. Now we had did this for three weeks. We had, you know, we did a three week vacation Bible study and it was amazing. The first week it was challenging, you know, because the kids didn't know how to react because they had always been paid attention to when they misbehaved. Someone always focused on the bad and this wasn't happening now. So it was a learning curve for them because they didn't know what to make of it. So by the time the first week is over, you know, now and also let me say this, they're going home and their parents are not coming after them about it, their misbehaviors. They're saying, oh, I heard you learned this and I, you did this and you drew this. And so it began to reprogram the kids' mindset of themselves. So, and I'm not saying that they did not misbehave. Children were children and they, you know, did things, whatever, but we corrected them. We disciplined as need be and we moved forward. It came to the point where they were doing more good than not good. Because that's what we focused on. That's what we celebrated. That is what we told everyone about. Even parents were reprogrammed because they said the only time they ever got a call regarding their child was when they did something bad. So they begin to think bad of the child and they every time the phone rang, they thought it was something bad. So this was a way to help them think of their child in a better light and to focus. And the, And what was happening is that the children were telling the parents, well, I got into this argument with so-and-so and this is what would happen and this is how we resolved it and we're friends now. And And the parents was just like, what? Like, what just happened here? But because we did not focus on the weakness, we celebrated the progress and the strength that they had to the point where they wanted to develop it more. So that was what we, we did. We, we caught what they were doing right and we harped on that and we built that up and we loved on them because of that. And that's not saying that we didn't correct when they did something wrong. We just didn't focus on it. Imagine how many people would change their mindsets of themselves and to others if we stopped spotlighting their weaknesses. See, we all have rough edges. We will all let people down. But see, beating each other up over these things isn't going to help anything. See, when you focus on negative things, there are several things that happen. See, we develop a critical spirit rather than a positive spirit. See, we also push people away rather than draw them. Um, when we focus on negative things, we hinder the unity in the body of Christ because we are forcing people to choose sides rather than to work together. When we focus on negative things, we are, we, we, we are become a poor witness for Christ because God and Christ was love. You know, when we focus on negative things, what it shows is that we lack love. You know, when we focus on negative things, we make other people skittish and rather, you know, standoffish and that they're not willing to risk because they're afraid of failure and the ridicule that's follow. So therefore, you may have somebody that wants to make a big jump into joining the ministry or creating a program that helps, you know, the hungry or children. But because of negative reactions and things like that, they may just say, yeah, I don't want to do that because they think they're going to get ridiculed. 
But the biggest thing what happens is that when we're negative and we focus on negative, we invite others to be critical of us. You know, now you may be saying, well, there has to be an upside to this. There has to be something to look forward to or whatever. There is no upside to being negative. But see, when we're positive towards people, when we're showing them love and everything, we spur people, you know, to give, we we give them courage and strength. We build a spirit of appreciation and oneness within the body of Christ. You know, people will open, begin to open up and we discover some incredible things about them. People will begin to speak well of us. People will try harder and dream bigger. And instead of dealing with conflict and anxiety, you get to deal with laughter and joy and peace. And the most important thing of all, when you focus on being positive, God smiles. You know, sure, there's a lot we can say. And there's even more we can learn, you know, when it comes to controlling these thoughts and making sure they don't become a stronghold in our lives. You know, think about this. Are you living in God's peace or are we constantly trying to, are we constantly going back and forth or having anxiety and worrying? You know, do your thoughts, what happens when you have idle moments with your thoughts? Are they godly? Or are they going to the left, to the left real quick? You know, are you a negative person or are you a positive person? You know, do you need people to build you up or tear them? I'm like, do you build people up or do you tear them down? You know, I can't imagine that there isn't a single one of us who doesn't need a little improvement. Like, ask God to help, you know, and we can help one another. Of course, we'll hate it at first. But we, if you see the negative and destructive thinking creeping up in our minds, take a rest of it. Take a hold of it. Do not, do not, I repeat, do not let it just sit there and be like, hey, ho, how are we going to do? What's up? Like, we got to stop that. We have to stop it because if not, we can, we're doing more harm than good. So as we begin to close, I want us to think about some of the ways that we can evaluate our thoughts by just asking some overall impacting questions when we are in the throes, whether, you know, we are talking to someone, whether we're sitting in our quiet time. Um, one of the main, some of the main questions I want you to ask yourself, where does this thought come from? You know, that's always a good thing. What's leading it? What's driving it? What is the factor behind it? Um, where will these thoughts lead me? Is it going to be something of God? Is it going to be uplifting? Is it going to be powerful? Or is it going to be, you know, detrimental? Very important one is, will these thoughts get me to where I want to go? Nine times out of ten, the answer to that is going to be no, and you need to throw it in the pit. Um, another question is, are these thoughts scripturally acceptable? You know, will, this th will, will they build me up or tear me down? A key one is, could I share these thoughts with someone else? If the answer to that is no, you definitely have to leave it alone. If you couldn't think of having a conversation with somebody regarding the thoughts that's going on in your mind, that should be a key indicator. That should be a red flag that these are not thoughts. These are not godly thoughts. These are not pure thoughts. These are not things that you want to have and you need to talk with God and you need to really seek him to move those from you. Also, a good one is where did the thoughts originate? And sometimes we think it is one thing 
but it may be a situation that has brought up really an old wound that never healed. You know, do these thoughts make me feel guilty? If you think bad about somebody and after you think it, you feel bad, then yeah, you need to get that under, you know, arrest. And also finally, do they show you as the thoughts that you're having, does it show that you are a follower of Christ? And if the answer is no, then you know you have to work on some things. See, I hope you get the idea. You know, of course it can be a little annoying at first and maybe a little dangerous. But we need to be accountable. You know, you have to, we don't, we don't want to be negative thinkers. We want to be godly thinkers. We don't want to be, you know, suck the life out of a situation. We want to infuse life into the people and circumstances around us. You know, we want to stand for, for which is pure and not cave into which is not. We want to choose the good, enjoy the beautiful, pursue the noble and walk into the sweetness of God's peace. You know, so... So I hope you will be encouraged to think better thoughts. Because I know me, you know, we may grumble some time, but we'll eventually be grateful. You know, and I hope that you can be the same. Of course, it doesn't, all, it may not always start out that way. But we can, with good practice, be grateful and loving and kind. So, let us get our thoughts under way so that we can be the best version of us, so that we can do everything that God has us to do at any point in time. Don't let a fleeting moment pass you by or an opportunity pass you by. Because you had things going on in your mind that kept you from being where God needs you to be. So I want to thank you for listening to the Moving Past You radio show. Be sure to visit us on our Facebook page to join the conversation and to access show notes and to get fantastic bonus content. You can also subscribe to us on iTunes. And Spotify, you can just search for Moving Past You. Again, we are embarking on this for the month of September, the series Character Under Construction. And on next week, we will be discussing guarding our hearts. And we'll be coming from Proverbs 4 and 23. Again, this is September. This is going into our, what I call our holiday season, and we are going to be working on our character. Thank you so very much for joining us. Be blessed. Have an amazing, amazing evening. And always remember to be kind in your word, in your thought, and in your deed. Be blessed and we'll see you on next Thursday at the same time as we go into part two of the series Character Under Construction, Guarding Our Hearts. Love you. Be blessed and have a wonderful, wonderful evening. Good night.